Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jian Ping. Uh, you can call me Ping. That's my colleague call me. And first of all, I would like to, uh, too loud. I would like to uh, thanks 2023 Gaoyang International Flower Forum and Korea American Seeds and Seedlings invited me to be here. I'm very excited because this is my first time uh, to visit South Korea and it's very good learning uh, opportunity for me. I'm uh, looking forward to know more uh, colleagues here and uh, also experience the rich uh, Korean culture. So I was suggested to be, uh, it's so light here, uh, I was suggested to give a talk about flower breeding in the future. I thought, let's take a look back first uh, what has been happened in the last 20 years or so uh, in the flower breeding, then we can anticipate what is likely going to happen in the future. So my talk today is innovations in flower breeding, past and the future. Before I talk about breeding, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the company I have been working for. Bao, a horticulture company, was founded by George Bao in 1905. Currently, it is under uh, the leadership of third and fourth generation, Susanna, uh, Anna Bao and Susanna Bao. Um, it, Bao's headquarters is located in Western Chicago, Illinois. Um, <clears throat> and now, it has, Bao has, uh, I think, uh, has facilities uh, in uh, six continental and uh, 20 countries. Bao is uh, been known to supply uh, plant varieties as seeds, young plants, and cut, cut, uh, cuttings. Yeah. Okay, in the five uh, supply chain in flower industry, Bao involved the first two breeder, producer, and distribution. So our premier customer is Finnish growers who, uh, who grow the, the product, uh, product to the retailer for our consumers. So Bao Horticulture Company contain four breeding companies, which include the Pan American Seeds, Clift Seeds, uh, Darwin Perennial Flower, Bao flower plants and uh, uh, star rose and plants. Bao also include uh, about 19 distribution companies. Some of them are joint adventure. Uh, at our Bao, our Bao business unit, we work together to, towards our mission to color the world. So Pan-American Seas, like I said, Pan-American Seas is one of the Bao breeding companies, uh, which is bred, has bred and uh, introduced, brought to the market innovation of product uh, like annual perennials, vegetables, potted plants, and uh, cut flowers. I have been working for Pemmerican Seeds for 23 years, and uh, our, our company celebrated 75th anniversary in last year. Uh, the goal at Pan American Seeds is to be a global leader of breeding, production, and deliver high seed quality of innovative, innovative and uh, best, class, best uh, in the class uh, for our customers. Pan American Seeds has uh, six breeding locations and six production locations and about seven sales support locations. Our product go to the world in over 90 countries. So one of the breeding location is in urban uh, Illinois, which is I am located. You can see from this picture uh, there's greenhouses, there are open field for breeding and trialing. Um, quite a many of the products actually is bred from here. So now, 
Now we can talk about breeding. So what is plant breeding? I have two definitions quoted here. First is, plant breeding is an application of genetic principles to produce plants that are more useful to humans. Second is, plant breeding is the art and science for changing the traits of the plants who are more, which are in order to produce a desirable characteristics. So how, so now how it works? I would, I think plant breeding is a process. Remember it's a process. First to create a genetic variations. Second is play with genetic, this genetic variations to like recombination selections to leading to a new product. So how, how you create a genetic variations? Of course, there's a quite a many method. I listed here, of course, traditional breeding is, is number one, uh, which you can include, the traditional breeding include uh, all the selves and all type of crosses, back crosses, um, and also uh, nature mutation is important as well. Um, in the, the created the genetic variation also comes through interspecific or intergenetic hybridization. Now also create a genetic variation include the biotechnology to create, uh, which include the traditional cellular technology, include like uh, chromosome manipulated chromosome numbers, tissue culture, embryo rescue, protoplast fusion, or uh, somatic hybridization. Of course, you can throw the um, chemistry or radiation to, 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 to make the plants uh, new variations. Uh, also, uh, DNA marker assistance selections, uh, genetic, genetic engineer or genomic editing. So all this method, you create these variations, you need to go to, through the cycles of generations of evaluation, selection, and test across and trialing in order to get a product. And uh, we have to remember is the breeding is not just use this technology or techniques. Vision provides an important role as well, which can de direct our selections towards to a more desirable product. So this slide is just a summary of the process to develop a product, product which from trait identification, germplasm evaluation, phenotype or genotype analysis, to a genetic recombination and selection, and to test across or evaluation or new experimentals. And then you have to go through production evaluation, that leading to the plant introduction. Now, what has happened in the flower breeding in the last 20 years? I'm going to give you some examples, which is my experience. So first is the product, product convention, which, which first is some of the vegetative product that has been converted to a seeds product. Second is there's quite a few of crops which traditionally is open pollinated product now become a F1 hybrid. You know, F1 hybrid normally is much strong performance and much uniform. And there's also, there's a lot of more has been happening, like a new product derived from interspecific and intergeneric hybridization. And also the nature mutation and mutagenesis play a role as well. I will give you some of those examples. And of course, disease resistant and stress tolerance, which always has been an important, important choice for breed, breeder to work. Uh, to, to work. And um, of course, there's uh, you know, more DNA marker help the, the selections and uh, genetic engineering product, for example, the blue rose, which is introduce the blue pigment from the finia into uh, the rose. Um, okay, so in the next uh, following presentation, I'm going to give you uh, some, some of the examples which 
derived some of the product examples which is related to what I mentioned the techniques here. So first, uh, like, I, like, like I mentioned, uh, you know, there are some product are very popular in both product form. For example, in patient and petunias, which is very common, it has single flowers and double flowers, and it has both vegetative product form and the seeds product form. Some product has been only available for uh, and only available as a vegetative product for quite a long time. For example, Angelonia. Angelonia is performing quite well under hot, humid, and drought conditions. American Seeds, about 15 years ago, introduced a two series F1 hybrid, which is called, I still have difficult to say the name, but Serenia and Serenata, which is a pretty big, big, big achievement in breeding. So now growers have a choice or make them easier, either they grow a vegetative product or they can grow a product from seeds. Which actually, if I remember correctly, that those two Angelonia F1 hybrid series are still the only seeds product on the market. Now I'm going to talk about wave petunias. Um, first, uh, wave petunia. Wave probably is the most well-known uh, brand name in petunia in the grower level and in the consumer level. Um, which is the it's first uh, it's an interspecific hybrid. Second uh, is it is the first uh, true trailing spreading petunia from seeds. And we have we have been develop, we have developed uh, five wave series with more than forty five varieties with different uh, different uh, uh, plant characteristics or habit in order to meet the marketing needs, which I'm going to um, give a little bit more details for each of the series. And also, uh, we are celebrate 27 years uh, on the Wave brand on the market. And Wave actually deliver a easy and spreading colors. So wave petunia, this is the original wave series, which, um, which is a true prostrated spreading petunia and uh, doing very well in the hot, cold, and rainy season. And uh, <clears throat> it has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six colors of them. Our uh, wave actually is a set, a standard, uh, for the grower and the consumer uh, uh, stand, standard uh, of put, set a standard uh, <laughs> a product uh, as for uh, for the consumer and uh, and the grower which one thing i want to mention i forgot almost uh, is probably wave is the best performance when the botrytis are present than any other petunias so among these six colors, uh, purple classical, common velour, and uh, uh, lavender got uh, all American selection winners. And the lavender also received a floor select um, gold medal. And just by the way, I'll, if you don't know what is the AAS selection, which is the North American flower industry organization who are I gave an award for the product was performance good enough or excellent performance. And Floor Select is a European similar uh, award for but in European. This slide just show you how the wave product uh, oh, saw the, I think this is not an updated <laughs> presentation. Um, version. I, that's why I'm a little surprised, but that's okay. So just to show you how the purple wave and uh, uh, other wave varieties performance in a big city, like actually this is in Seoul, uh, in, in the workway and uh, 
the highway. Tidal wave. Tidal waves you think about as tidal wave. What is a tidal wave? It's more mountain, create a mountain of colors, which is good for the big space and a big, big basket in a big city, um, which recover very well from the rain. And there's five colors. Um, Tidal wave of silver and red of law are also American select winner and floor select, uh, floor select gold medal, yeah. And uh, Easy Wave. Easy Wave is a boat and create a series which has mountain and trailing spreading habit, more control the trailing spreading habit than wave and tidal wave. It has the most color range, you can tell. It's about 19 colors. And we still continue adding more. So easy way we can use as a solo color or mixed colors for a home gardener or for landscape. Uh, which easy way is very friendly for growers, uh, but not sacrifice consumers' performance. E3 easy wave. E3 is a newest uh, series we just introduced a couple of years ago. And from the name, you can think it's early, efficient, and evolution of Easy Wave. Um, the habit of E3 even more control the habit, more uniform in flower time, and the plant structure can use less PGR. Um, it's perfect for the early season. Shark Wave. Shark Wave actually is the similar structure as Easy Wave, but with plenty of tons of small flowers or petite flowers. In the, in the shark wave, there are some colors that are quite unique, which include denim and purple tie-dye, as shown here. So now I'd like to give you examples of how important one of the nature mutation can make the, uh, the petunia breeding so uh, significant. So, back in uh, about 2003, there is one plant with the light green colors in a big population of white flowers. So at the beginning, the light green color was not something particularly interesting for quite many people actually. But I felt, I feel it's very unique. I never see this color before. So I started study it, find out very soon it's a single dominant allele control this color change from white to green. It's not only from white to green. If you introduce this allele into different genetic background of breeding lines, it's come out with uh, many unexpected, very unique patterns and colors. Um, I will show you in the next slides. So this slide just show you, you have to remember this is back in 2005. 2003 found out that a mutation. 2005, the color is, is appear because of this allele at that time. Uh, you can see in here, um, probably some of it's harder, you know, from the left, left or right. Uh, you know, the, the black, and then always this either three color or tricolor or bicolor. Though you have to remember this color, you never see this before 2010 actually commercialized. Commercial, commercial variety, you don't see this color in petunias. This is really a very unique uh, at that time. So because of the significant contribution on the colors and the patterns of the petunia flowers. This allele got a US um, utility pattern. Uh, this picture, I just show you some of the commercial varieties was bred in Pan American seeds related to this allele. Um, of course, those varieties are not any new. It's, it's first uh, 
the black variant was introduced in 2010. It's the first black petunia ever in the history. So that's why it's received a medal of, how you see that, a medal of excellent for industry choice and reader's choice, which is a pretty big deal. And then other colors continue coming, like uh, the velour color and the yellow rose, you know, star and the black and the yellow star. This star, now you see the color is not unique anymore because it's, uh, there's many already on the market. But many, you know, back in that time, the star, traditional petunia stars, only white with other colors. Not the yellow with other colors. This color all due to this mutation. And it's also uh, um, this uh, black pinkish star was when the flora star uh, award. Okay, here I want to just want because I mentioned the velour colors, and I want to show you what is the difference of classical red compared to uh, velour red. So you can see on the top, the classical petunia red is bright red. With the allele, you can make the color much deeper, vivid, and sometimes with the center black color. Um, I want to just pick it up again, tidal wave red velour on this side, and the easy wave, easy wave red velour over there, and in the middle is the wave common velour compared to classical purple wave. You can see how the colors here. So this GC allele is not just a bio genetics. It, uh, it is actually extended to the whole flower industry in the, breed, in the petunia breeding. All petunia breeders actually using this allele create tons of unique colors. I show you just here a few of those. It's already commensured uh, vegetative product in the market from other company than Bao. You see this color range. The next, uh, I want to give you an example of a product, unique product derived from intergeneric hybridization between petunia and the color bacoa, business yellow petunia. Uh, this is, uh, like I mentioned, an example of intergeneric cross between the two uh, genes. Um, I want to show here is specific here, this one is a traditional petunia yellow color looks like. Then the rest of them you can tell is the business yellow. How yellow AR it is and how, how good a, a performance they are, that's why the business Yellow petunia was winning uh, our American Select gold medal, which is pretty big uh, because the last petunia win this award is 54 years ago. So this is pretty uh, something. <clears throat> and this slide just show you in 2021 uh, how business uh, yellow petunia performance in Netherlands in a raining season. And not only North American uh, award we received, but the European Flora Star and uh, um, what is that? The best new bedding and potted plants from UK as well. So it's quite exciting. Oh, plus the industry uh, award. So I mentioned the, uh, the business yellow petunia, which is vegetative propagated. Now, I give, we are, Pamela can see, just introduced a new series called Color Burst Pacoa, which is also derived intergeneric hybridization. But it's a seed, it's a hybrid one, F1 hybrid. Um, <clears throat> then uh, you can see the yellow color, and this variety was matched very well in petunias. You can grow in a mixed container. Another, another example for interspecific hybridization product is Soloscape Interspecific Impatience, which is the first interspecific impatient from seeds. Uh, just introduced a few years ago. 
you can see how beautiful they are performed in the garden and, uh, and in the landscape. It's also win uh, an industry medal of, medal of excellence. So now we were talking about disease resistance. So back in 2011, uh, the downhill mildew, inpatient downhill mildew disease was almost uh, eliminated all inpatient Boreana crop globally on the market. Um, this downhill mildew is, uh, disease was spread very fast when the weather are uh, cooler and, and uh, high humidity conditions, which can kill, no, which can can eliminate all flower colors, flowers in the plants, or even kill the plants. You can see in this picture, this is all inpatient in the field. Um, no flower color, just because of this disease. And also some individual lines completely dead. In order to respond to this serious disease, primary can see the developer, uh, in, uh, an uh, inpatient series is called Beacon Inpatient, which is highly genetic resistant to the downhill mildew. Uh, you can see here the picture showed in the small containers, in the bigger containers, and in the field. When the disease appears, the susceptible variety completely dead in the field, and the Beacon Inpatient was full of flowers. Now, because of the genetic highly resistant to downy mildew, now the, the growers and the consumers don't have to worry about downy mildew disease. So they can enjoy the beautiful landscape beacon inpatient and the home garden. Not only single inpatient, primary American seeds breeder also bred a double inpatient, which is also resistant to downy mildew. The name is called Glamour. See how beautiful they are. Also resistant. So now we are going to talk about another crop. Echinacea. Echinacea is a perennial, which is originated in a prior area in North America. Uh, which is very draw tolerance, uh, maintain, easy to maintain. There are lots of species in Echinacea. I listed here five of them is more popular, but especially the Echinacea purpurea is the most valuable in the ornamental. So traditional Echinacea purpurea only have two colors. One is purple rose, no. Pink, pinkish purple, and one is white. And I just mentioned one more is, that's a species of paradoxa with a yellow color. Just remember that traditional Echinacea purpurea variety on the market are um, OP product, which usually is taller and less branching and lots of variation in flower and time. Now, so in 2006, Primary American Seeds introduced also an OP product. It's called a Power Wild Berry and a White. What is the difference of our OP product compared that time the marketing has the traditional OP product? One is the plants. We bring the plants are shorter, much easier for the grower and for the retailer. And the second is branching very well. So there's a number of, number of flowers per plants are huge improvement. And the second, third is very uniform in flowering time. They all first year flowering. Um, <clears throat> so the two color matched very well. The wild berry, the difference is you can, I don't know, the picture is not in the same slides, but people know echinacea probably know this. The significant is the color. It's the true rose varied color with the wider flower petals overlapped. So it's very beautiful. And because of that, we 
get another utility pattern on the wildberry. This picture just shows you how the wildberry performance in the landscape. Now, as I mentioned, purpurea traditionally only have two colors, purple and white. But we also know Echinacea paradoxa has yellow colors. But with the plants are tall, poor branching, and the flower has very narrow petal, droopy as well. So the breeder has been trying and thinking long time, trying to bring the yellow color into purpurea. Of course, after so many years, hard work, uh, effort, uh, it, is, it has happened. So Pan American Seeds introduced a variety called Shan'an Spread, which has the genetically mixed colors in the variety. This is also a huge, a huge achievement, I think, as a, as a echinacea breeding history. It's not only bring the yellow color. Of course, this is not just a simple. It's uh, involved a lot of back crosses and many things in order to get this point. So it's not only yellow color, but also bring red, burgundy, uh, coral, orange uh, color into purpurea. So the shine spread win uh, quite a few uh, industry award as well because of the super performance. So this slide just to show you how beautiful, how many flower colors and how many flowers in from one product. So once that shine spread on the market, which is genetically mixed colors, and we know the market is going to ask single separate colors. That's what we did. We introduced we introduced the first F1 hybrid artisan with individual colors. Because it's the hybrid, uh, it's much more uniform, and so much more uniform and uh, branch very well, and uh, a grower can choose whatever color they want. At this moment, we have three colors on the market, uh, artisan red umbrella, yellow umbrella, and a soft orange. And the whole series is a win an uh, industry uh, award as well. This is just to show you the more colors going to come in for the Artisan uh, F1 hybrid. Scarlet, deep purple rose, and white. How they do it in the field. Uh, I probably need a quick uh, my time. Yeah. Okay. So... So not only, okay, we are not only breeding OP F1 hybrid of echinacea, we are bred tissue culture propagated echinacea as well for our, for our sister company, Darwin Perennial. So here show you Sambrea has 12 colors and Sambrea Pelco has five colors. This is just show you how beautiful a Sambrea what is that name? Um, Flamingo orange, how they perform in the, in the landscape. And not only single flowers, we're bred for tissue culture propagated double flower echinacea as well, which has two, two series, double scoop and double scoop deluxe. This is to show you one of the bubble gum, double scoop bubble gum performed in the landscape. Last things, not last things, but in echinacea, I want to mention one more thing. Um, because we talk about natural mutations. Um, the breeder just have to have that eye and to catch that variations. So we found, okay, before I say we found, but we, let's, let's say what echinacea, okay. Echinacea flower, one flower from open to completely off about one and a half months, sometimes even longer than that. Think about that long time. Flower petal color will fade. You can see from the 
that side of that small pictures from yellow when the flower aged, it become more pale, creamy. But we found the plants, which is on the top. No matter how old the flower are, the color never fade. So that is some real purple yellow. Because of this, we gain, we, we got another utility pattern for this non-fading yellow colors. Not only yellow, in the future, we're going to have more. The non-fading can come to the orange or golden yellow. OK, now we have to look at what has happened in the last 20 years or so. Now, what we are anticipating in the breeding trends for the next 20 years? I'm sure everyone has your own opinions. I just give you some of my thought. Of course, the traditional breeding is going to be forever. You have to have that. That's the base. And we are going to see, um, but I'm anticipating to see more and more the technology is going to be used or combined with the traditional breeding in order to deal with the more difficult challenge the trade successfully. And we are going to continue. OK, I want to, before I go there, OK. I want to say some of the technology techniques has been around for quite a while, but it's been not used in ornamental breeding uh, uh, enough, I would, say. I would think. Maybe it's because of too much cost before and take too long time, or it's lack of information in the flower uh, crop. But now it's become a more and more valuable. I think you can see that. Um, now, I'm also anticipating more uh, species, uh, new species, uh, or synthetic species, uh, or a variety is going to continue derived from interspecific or intergenetic crosses, or continue to be more, to be uh, domesticating from the wild species directly. So those techniques is going to be easier breeding in, in flower crop rather than the food crop. With that technique, we were t uh, the trends of the technique we're going to say, so what are we going to anticipate breeding target? Uh, of course, this is a continual. Breeding is a continuous. It's not continuously work. So I'm going to say it's going to be, you're going to say expanded uh, uh, breeding is going to continue looking for novelty or diversity in color, pattern, and plant structure, and continue to say disease and pest resistant, stress tolerance like heat, cold, drought, and nutrition deficiency. So you can get some product which is more adapted to the un unfavorable conditions. Of course, we are going to continue breeding for product which are more friendly for growers, retailers, and consumers. For example, seed quality continuously, propagation efficiency, and less maintenance. And we also have to remember, uh, now, now remember, the, the, like what uh, we were just heard this morning, the cut flower business is going to be continue to grow globally. So the longevity after harvesting is going to be remain very important. I'm almost done. So uh, currently, you know, so with that, so what we are anticipating in the product trends, I'm sure everyone already know this. I just listed here. You know, the industry is going to continue to develop annual perennial tropical foliage, ornamental grass and forms and uh, shrubs and the wood, woodies. And those plants is going to be, of course, be used bedding, landscape, container, all kinds of containers, house plants, and cut flowers. In the mixed containers or combos, we are anticipated to see more diversified. You know, you can have a single flower, single colors, multiple colors, single crops, multiple crops, crops together, or even mixes with annual, perennial, vegetable, even vegetables and flower foliage, grass. OK, before I conclude my talk, I would like to thank Pan American Seeds breeding and the product development team 
for the crops of beacon inpatient, solo scape in, in, interspecific inpatient, uh, color burst pacoa, uh, and angelonia for I use as an example. And a special thanks to my breeding team for all the crops, all the product of Petunia and Echinacea. Again, I would like to thank you everyone and thanks for, uh, again for the Gaoyang International Flower Organization and translator now. <laughs> and also I'd like to thank um, Korea American Seed and Seedling, Mr. Mr. Kames, the two <laughs> Kames. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you everyone. Thanks. 여러분 다시 한번 큰 박수 보내주시기 바랍니다. Thank you very much. Now we have a question and answer session. Only one question. 자, 한 가지 정도 저희가 질문을 좀 나누면서 마무리해 보면 좋을 것 같습니다. 지금 시간 관계상 한 가지 정도만 받도록 하겠습니다. 혹시 질문이 있으시다면 손을 좀 들어주시고요. 역시 마이크를 전달을 드리겠습니다. 네. 자, 마이크 전달을 좀 부탁을 드릴게요. 손 한번 들어주시고. 네, 고맙습니다. 아, 네. 유럽과 일본 그리고 영국의 화훼 소비량이 많은데 이러한 이유, 이유가 무엇인지 어, 어떻게 생각하시는지 궁금합니다. I think the question you asked is similar uh, as the first question, uh, the previous question you were asking the previous speaker. I think there, you know, you already answered, which is already answered. I agree. I think you know it's the traditional habit. Also, economically, you have to be affordable. No, I shouldn't say affordable. It's just a, like like you mentioned. It's not a food. You have essential, but it's a little bit of pleasure. And good. So I think that's probably one reason, most important reason. I think when people are so the, the, the basic needs for food and, uh, and the clothing, people are looking for more um, spread. I'm sorry, my English. So more something luxury, beauty, and it just make you happy. I think more and more country you can see, you, you have that showed in the develop, develop countries, you know, the, the consumption is continual growth. I think that's probably the main reasons. Thank you very much. Now it's time to wrap up the session. So thank you very much for your insightful presentation. 여러분, 다시 한번큰 박수로 저희는 마무리를 하도록 하겠습니다. Thank you so much.